everybody. It's Jason Shadrick with Chasing Frets. Uh, and I'm once again here with Andy Ellis. How you doing, Andy? I am doing well, Jason. And it's fun to be here talking about guitar. Yeah. And so this week's guest is Nir Felder, uh, who is a, a jazz guitar player, you could say, uh, based out of New York. But he's done quite a bit of, of work with uh, non-jazz-centric artists, uh, and most notably probably Erica Badu, Ben Platt, and a bunch of others. Um, so uh, Andy and I have spent some time listening to the new record, uh, which is called Two, and it comes out July 10th. Uh, and Andy, you've, you've checked it out quite a bit. What did you think of it? I was amazed and impressed with the depth of the textures. That's what I was going to say, because it's kind of like a trio record, but it's, it's so layered, and there's much more sound coming out than... He really spends a lot of time not only playing with his trio on the tracks, but also going and extracting sounds, little whispery things of running his finger up and down the strings through echo and stuff. And Mm -hmm. to me, that is very much of a post-Jimi Hendrix kind of way of looking at jazz guitar. When I went to Berkeley, he went to Berkeley too, but when I went to Berkeley, Jimi was touring, and there were no professors, zero professors on staff at Berkeley who even could play Wind Cries Mary. I mean, they, they could play the hell out of bebop, but they weren't. Right. They weren't. But near won the Jimi Hendrix Award at Berkeley that they even mm-hmm. have won. But when he graduated, <laughs> they gave him, he won the award. So we yeah. hear it in his, in his textures. Yeah, and you'll hear it on this episode. So this episode, we're going to talk about his kind of unique approach to visualizing the fretboard. I know a lot of people are probably familiar with, with the cage system. This isn't quite that at all. And um, I think I heard a little bit, the first person I really kind of heard talk about this kind of approach, I think was in the the Advancing Guitars book with Mick Goodrick, where he talks of, so simply about playing things on one string, playing solos on one string. Yeah. And Nier does a great job of, of really kind of breaking down his approach to that and then demonstrating a ton yeah. of, of what he does and, and, and how he not only improvises melodies, but he improvises fingerings, which I think yeah. is the real takeaway from this episode. Yeah. So uh, if you want to reach out to us, you can hit us up at chasingfrets at premierguitar.com. Uh, you can reach out to me, Andy, or Joe. And uh, thanks for hanging with us. And we'll, uh, we'll go right now to our conversation with Nier Felder. Jason. So uh, for this first uh, episode this week, we're going to talk about something that you and I have touched on a little bit uh, before as we've been having guitar text changes, how you visualize the fretboard. Because what uh, interests me about your playing so much when I see videos of you is that it's kind of hard for me to recognize the patterns and the shapes that you're thinking about when you're improvising. Now, uh, I know you're a Berkeley grad. Um so was there, when you were at Berkeley, was there kind of, uh, and taking lessons, was there kind of a system they kind of programmed into you? No, not this? at all. I, I think that I've always kind of done it my own way, and that's why I'm happy you asked about it, because it's a little different, and it's something that I don't know if, I don't know if it would work for everybody, but I share it with people because it worked really well for me where other things didn't. You know, I tried doing, mm-hmm. tried doing it the all the normal ways, you know, the the shapes, the cage system, and I think three note per string stuff, I think all that stuff is really cool. It just didn't work for me. Um, Now that I've had my own thing and I've been doing it for so many years, I go back and look at those things and I get new ideas from them. But when I was learning, those things like very much did not work for me and this did. So it's just a different thing and you know, I like to tell people about it and see maybe it'll work for them like it did for me. Now was this something you had uh, kind of started to uncover before Berkeley yeah, or I kind of figured it out, I guess, a little bit myself, just because, like I said, the other things weren't working for me, and I kind of had to do a little more digging to figure out mm-hmm. what did. So, can you give us a short kind of breakdown of what what I'll this process is? Thing, and I'll, I'll try to play a little bit too, just so you can hear what I mean. Okay. Um, the first thing I was taught as a young guitar player was the pentatonic scale, this classic. 
And that's kind of a magical shape, like. You can really make a lot of music in that box. And that's really all I needed as a young, you know, aspiring blues rock player. Um, when I wanted to get into different harmonic territory, I had teachers show me the major scale for the first time. And they typically showed it to me in one of two ways, like the three note per string way. Or like the kind of positional, I guess this would be like the more cage system. Finger. And I tried to do what I did with the pentatonic scale um, with that, like just play in position and, and have it sound great, you know, to, or to what to me was great. And that's what I couldn't do. I couldn't figure out how that box made music with that scale, with those major scales and the modes. And it just kind of stumped me how people would play all this great stuff and they'd be like, yeah, I'm just playing the major scale. And then I would go to my shape and um, it just wouldn't, wouldn't sound the same. You know, if I listened to Miles Davis or um, from a guitar perspective, Bill Frizzell or... John Schofield or Pat Metheny, it's like, what are they doing that I'm not doing, you know? So I started to kind of figure out that what worked for me was seeing the guitar kind of horizontally. Like instead of in a shape, just kind of going across the neck, like, like the guitar was one thing. Instead of breaking it into like these little pieces of guitar, you know, these four fret or six fret, whatever, chunks of guitar that you would kind of add together to make one whole guitar, um, I started seeing the guitar as one thing, or trying to at least. So I would start practicing scales like this. Um, if you take your C major scale, I would play it one string at a time, and in my head I would say E, that's the third, F, that's the fourth, G, that's the fifth, and so on and so forth. On each string. A, that's the sixth. That's the C major scale on every string one at a time. And then I would maybe improvise on a string just to get used to like making music out of. Just to get used to like mm -hmm. moving my hands like that, you know? And then the next thing I would do would be play the whole scale from my lowest possible note to my highest possible note and kind of improvise the fingering. Like never play it the same way each time. One time I would go all the way up the low E string and then go up or maybe I would switch in the middle. I didn't really have a set way of doing it. My goal was kind of to do it differently every time. the notes in C major that you have on the guitar and where I'm playing them changes every time. Sometimes I'll play the F here, sometimes I'll play it there, sometimes I'll play it there, um, stuff like that. So that was my way in. And then the same thing, I'd improvise with that. I would go... Just playing, just playing across the whole guitar, just playing the C major scale, the same thing that I could not do when it was in a box, I kind of found that I could do when it was not in a box. Um, it made it kind of come to life, and it gave me, um, once I learned the scale across the whole guitar like that, I also realized everything which was not in the scale, I kind of started visualizing that too, so. 
So playing all the notes that weren't in the scale became easier. You know, it didn't, I wasn't as locked in as I was before. Um, so that was like a real thing for me as a young student, trying to learn the guitar in a way that I think most people, no one told me to do it that way, but it worked for me. What I notice listening to you play is that I'm not hearing fingering, locked in fingering. And that may be what Jason's referring to when he says, you know, he hears you play and he's not, or even watching you play, you know, on video, he's not seeing the patterns that we're all taught, so many of us are taught when we're young, that are inflexible. And it's one of the things that when I teach, I'm very leery about teaching scales. I say, you got to learn your scales because it's a bridge to harmonic awareness. But if you spend too much time in your scales, you get locked into the patterns that are that are the efficient patterns, efficiency, you know, speed, efficiency. And that leeches into your music. And we all know guitarists who play that way. And everything, you, you, here it comes. And it's, it's done the same way every night. You know, the same fingering, the same pattern, the same picking also. You know, so that becomes a hand thing. So we're listening to somebody's hand work on the fretboard as opposed to listening to a melodic idea unfold. And I think you, you're, <laughs> you stumbled on something. I'm not going to say naively, but I just said naively. Okay, naively you stumbled on something that freed you from that hand prison that so many guitarists live in. Absolutely, and it, it's just funny, like, you know, we've heard scales described as, like, the building blocks or, or, or the, the toolkit that you'll use or, like, sometimes compared to words in language. But mm. I think that there's got to be something wrong with the system if, like, you know, imagine I, we were talking about language, right? And um, we had to say, well, don't, don't work too much on your words because you'll get stuck in your words. <laughs> you know what I mean? It just sounds so wrong. Yeah. So why is it that scales have become this thing that we get so stuck in? I, I just feel like it might be the way we're thinking about them and not the actual thing itself. There's nothing wrong with scales. It's just the fact that we, if we play them the same way every time, just like if we repeated the same sentences from a phrase book or something, you'd get stuck in it. And you wouldn't be able to have a normal conversation or a deep conversation if you only had your phrases. Um, and the thing about playing things the same way every time is that, you know, time doesn't work like that. You know, every night, uh, if you're on tour, you're in a new city, it's a different night with a different audience. You know, things change. There's a lot that we can't control that changes. So if you play things the same way, it'll work one night, it won't work the next night. But if you have the flexibility to adapt to the situation, um, I think you can be a little deeper in the music. And that's something, you know, I think it's a good goal for all of us. Yeah, and I think <clears throat> for me, when I was growing up, I think I got trapped into this, here's the scale positions that you need to learn and run them up and down. And and when I got to college, you know, it was when I was sitting my jury and there were mostly non-guitar players there, they were all like, wow, you know, all your scales pretty quickly when I'm just like doing one position, sliding up, doing one position, sliding up, doing one, right? And it's, it's kind of like a parlor trick. But one thing I, I remember early on, when I discovered Joe DiOrio in, in one of his, I can't remember if it was a Hot Licks or REH video, he had this thing, and and what he talks about was a little bit kind of what you alluded to was he calls it gesturing, where you just you you, you just think of a, a tonality, or or put some, put yourself put some kind of limitations, whether it's a key or a scale or whatever, and you just start playing through that and you're just wandering around the fretboard you're staying within these limitations but you're just wandering around the fretboard and seeing what kind of melodic and rhythmic things come up you know and what because that is kind of the truest sense of what you sound like you know because you're not thinking in terms of a very rigid uh pattern finger exercise pattern you know definitely you know so like once i learned I want to show you guys quickly the other things that I do with these scales and like some other yeah, yeah. quick practice thing. I'm gonna I'll go through it fast because I know we don't have a lot of time. But um, yes to all of that. Yeah, it's like not like you just 
practice scales, most of my time when I'm playing by myself is just, I'm just playing. I don't really have, like, I'm not a dedicated practice routine guy in the least. Um, I've tried to be at times, but it's more like I pick up the guitar and I play for a while and I just have fun with it. After I played the scales up and down the guitar, um, I'll play them in intervals. So for example, I'll play them in thirds. Sometimes, sometimes I'll play them together, sometimes separate, just to keep myself interested, you know, fourths. get the idea i just keep going until i can't go anymore yeah, yeah. um and i might now that now that right there is i think a perfect example of that i mean you were you were basically playing an exercise you had this this concept in your mind that you were systematically going through uh a scale in an intervolic way however i could totally hear bits of what you were playing that were more musical than a typical exercise that could lead you compositionally to some other nugget of idea that you wanted to develop. So it's like you're taking these exercises and you're just, you're putting in the work to, to repeat them until you get comfortable with them that you, they start to become more musical. Yeah. I mean, I feel like you should never turn the music off. So like when you're playing an exercise, it's got to sound great. You know, that's the goal. It's not, 
yes, you're trying to like achieve goal X of like successfully mastering this exercise, but more importantly probably is to play the exercise in a way that sounds musical and whatever means you have of doing that, whether it be with articulation or dynamics, like make it come alive, make it sound like music. Because if you shut the music off, you're in a, you know, a dangerous place where that part of your brain might also shut off when you're playing a gig or something. You know what I mean? Like it's got to always stay on. Um, one question I know I wanted to wrap up this segment with near is we've talked a lot about uh, a linear kind of a, approach, whether it's scales and, and moving these. And, and you touched a little bit when you went to the intervallic stuff just now about a, a bit of harmony when you're playing uh, two notes and thirds or fourths mm -hmm. or whatever. How did that kind of this, this view that you kind of developed of seeing the fretboard um, across the whole range of it, how did that also uh, go into you learning chord voicings? Did you follow a similar pattern for that? Totally, it's all the same thing, right? So like learn everything across your whole guitar. It could be like if you were working on your standard drop two voicings, you know. I play them across my whole guitar. It could be a, like a voicing that I made up, like a fourth with a tenth on top. And I could run that across the guitar, you know, and kind of, yeah, kind of everything across the whole instrument has been my, my goal, you know, just to try and, and learn this thing instead of just learning a piece of it and feeling like that was enough. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Nir, for taking the time uh, this week to hang with us and get pleasure. nerdy about guitar playing. So make sure to check out Nir's new record, too. Uh, it's going to come out July 10th. Uh, I'm sure anywhere that music is available was, was a good place to find it. So Nier's going to be back later this week, talk about a few more topics. So uh, hang with us, and we'll see you guys later this week. Bye, you guys. Bye.